welcome to the, uh, this is the fourth, not the third, the fourth, fourth episode that is of, the, uh, of the Armchair Philosophy Podcast. Goodness gracious. Yeah, so uh, with me today are uh, a few familiar faces and a new one here, so we'll start off with him first. Hey guys, it's Marco. Troilus. Rousseau. And Alessandro as always, and you join us today, you join us for a, a, quite, a uh, quite an interesting conversation about ethics. Oof, it's a, that's, that's a nasty one. That is a nasty one, but we're going to start off strong, and here's what we're going to start off with. Fellas, what's your definition of ethics? Is it, it and I should, I should probably just say this outright, there probably isn't a definition of ethics uh, that isn't already in the dictionary, yeah. but what to you, maybe, what to you is ethics, or what do you think belongs in the field of ethics? Yeah. Who wants to start off? I'll go. I say, I mean, you got to look at it from an individual's perspective. How does an individual um, conduct his life in the context of society? Um, you got to look at it from the individual's needs and, and desires and um, within the context of a society, yeah. Personally, I think it stems straight out of necessity. Uh, and unless I, I impede on, on anybody else's thoughts, that's really all I've got to say. Yeah, that's fine. Russo? Um, in all honesty, I, I really don't know what it is. I think it sort of kind of influences or or informs most of the decisions that we make as, as humans to a certain extent, but I guess that would be a, a variable factor in each individual's life. That And I, th- I think that brings up a really good point that we should address in this, in this conversation. How, how do we conduct our lives in accordance to, to our ethics? Yeah. Yeah, Alexander. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this about ethics. Um, I keep saying I'll say this about a lot of things. Yeah, you, you, what I think about ethics is <laughs> what I think about ethics is uh, it's a it's a way to to give meaning to I think the reactions that we may have to a lot of things that happen in our lives, right? So we may have a uh, a visceral reaction to something, or we may have a very positive reaction to something else. And while those while we sort of will accept those things as given okay we won't we won't necessarily question ourselves that much about it i think there's still something to be said about being absolutely sure about where those reactions come from right the way that we deal the way that we deal with our lives why is it why is it really a good thing that we help an old lady across the street it's very obvious i'll i'll grant you that but why is it obvious you know i think it's truly a um, knowledge seeking question not to you know go back on our previous podcast, but definitely it's, it's along those lines. Let's, uh, let's evaluate, I think. Start off with Marcos first. So what's, what's the driving factor behind what you thought to be the definition of ethics? I mean, one driving force? Or yeah, like, yeah, yeah or explanation or yeah, anything. I mean, it definitely order, rule of law in society. I think um, a justice system reflects on the society's ethos and the way we think sh- things should be done, and that changes over time, the response to the change in, in, in people to begin with. So um, I think you got to live your life in accordance with, with the present laws, and if, if something changes, you go ahead and um, try to make those changes in the justice system. Uh, so I think that ethics is kind of reflected in the, in the current justice so, system. Hmm. And so, so are you saying that that which is unlawful is, is unethical, totally and truly? No, because justice system has changed, and rule of law changes with great understanding of, of people. The rule of law changes, but I mean, as we can take with, with the recent legislation to legalize gay marriage and marijuana in Washington State, are, are we to say that, that gay marriage and marijuana was, was illegal until it was passed? And therefore unethical before yeah. the, just, yeah. Yeah, I think most people would say, I mean, for most of history, I think people would say smoking marijuana is, is not a, I mean, is somewhat unethical, and now, I mean now it's less unethical. I guess you could say. I mean, it's, there's no absolutes here. But but, but then how how can uh, it be ethical if or how how can it make that transition from unethical to ethical if the rubric by which the ethics is, uh, or in which the ethics pertains is based on its, on its legality? If you have something that's unlawful one day, and then lawful the next, even those who are supporting for its for its legalization are unethical until it's passed into legislation? Well, no, I'm not saying any other, again, no absolutes here. I mean, it's a trend. I mm-hmm. mean, I guess you could say drug use is getting more accepted um, as as not necessarily ethical, but not necessarily completely unethical as gay marriage is, you know, being a homosexual in general is getting more accepted. And it brings an interesting point. I mean, do, is, is there a degree to which that is ethical, unethical, and that which just kind of lands in the middle? 
Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's sort of something I always thought about is when we're talking about ethics and we're talking about specific bits of ethics, so some, a, a moral act, or sorry, sorry let me mm-hmm. rephrase that, an act which has some moral weight to it, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't really matter. Um, if it does end up falling in the, in the neutrality, I've always thought that if something was seen as not objectively bad and not objectively good at the same time, that it was because people really didn't understand where to place it, right? Because I think at that point it becomes part of becomes part of an a posteriori sort of idea about ethics, where people need to decide, right, to come to a consensus, maybe at the ballot box in some countries, maybe just over time, really, with others. It really depends on the system, but again, not to, dr- well, not to, not to drop too much into the culture aspect of it, it's just that um, I think it, it talks back to, to ethics being a living and breathing and changing thing over time. Yeah, well, it's it's a difficult one to, to pin. I mean, especially at this juncture in the conversation, you can uh, y- there's there's a lot of play with ethics. Uh, you can say the reading of a book is unethical, or like Mayor Bloomberg, the smoking of cigarettes is unethical. Uh, there's there, there's a lot of things that you know you could land in that neutral zone that could be taken, or one could take a position against in either case. Uh, We we could say not growing your beard is unethical, or not growing your beard is unethical. Don't say that to me, though. (laughs) (laughs) I I just shaved, so (laughs) I'm a little biased. (laughs) We're we're looking at Russo's beard. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure it's got got a life of its own. I think Russo's beard has better definition of ethics than Russo has. Probably at this moment in time, in fact, it does, and, and sometimes it has a mind of its own, and and can even munch on food. You know? <laughs> it Without my knowledge, it, it takes up knowledge. it takes up your 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 crumbs. Right. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna flow this idea out there. I think you know we're, definitions are fine and all that. We've established that. But yeah. We should probably get move into something interesting. Uh, if you've read, uh, if you if you know a little bit about us, you'll have figured out that we're all very highly connected to the University of Washington. Right. What? When did that happen? It happened, <laughs> it happened on the About Us page of the website. That's no, what no, no. Um, but so there's a, there's a, there's a professor there. He's, his name is William Talbot. Okay, uh, and um, he teaches a class uh, on and off, from what I understand, about uh, human rights. And you know, having having personally taken his class and having there's there's an idea that he floats that he floats around that I think would be interesting for this conversation is the idea that human rights uh, generally tend to have an, a, a positive uh, slope to them in terms of adding human rights and actually including people in whoever can have these rights, you know. Uh, it's, it's an interesting position. I wanted to see what you guys thought about mm-hmm. it. Like, if you, look, if you looked at, if you could possibly graph human rights, he, his idea would be that you could, you could see, like, an exponential growth in human rights. Maybe not to the T of an exponential function, but, you know, something along the lines of where before we didn't have many, now we have a lot. That's sort of the idea. Mm. I mean, that's definitely true. Like, you can see an exponential growth in in human rights, but I I would feel like that comes from a place of the fact that, at least for the developed world or, or the country that we live in, we've solved a lot more of the simpler problems, and the ones that are left are issues of morality and so they're going to be coming at the forefront of society um a lot more a lot more uh, contemporarily and so for that reason it has grown exponentially but for me personally I, I feel like it's a it's a tug of war i really don't know like yeah there's there's human rights uh growth but those are just on the books and in the law it's different from a society or group of people especially such a such a heterogeneous group of, of citizens that we have here in America to actually take those beliefs and internalize them within when you have uh, those ideologies conflict with religious values, um, personal values, family values, cultural values, because, I mean, we're just one big pot here, right? And, right. and quite frankly, I, I find that that line of thinking that Professor Talbot has taken to be an extremely uh, Western-centric uh, view if you it, it, it's based on a historical notion I'm assuming I haven't read yeah, his yeah. work but what, what you've told me of it um, 
it sounds as if he's he's basing this on on the western on a western concept. Uh, the degree of human rights has fluctuated throughout the world over the course of history. In western history, yeah, you know, we we go from, you know, let's say the let's say from Ukraine through North America, we we look at the course of history and we say, okay, yeah, uh, since the Greeks, you know, movements to, uh, as Marco mentioned earlier, to abolish slavery started, you know, in antiquity, and, you know, eventually slavery was abolished after the Enlightenment, and, you know, liberté, fraternité, and equalité, that all came up, and so on and so forth. At the same time, during the feudal era of Europe, the Almohad Caliphate in, in the Iberian Peninsula was one of the most prosperous and thriving areas on earth where people from all walks of life could enjoy their religion uh and really You're talking uh this is spain right? in spain yeah. in, in 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 uh muslim controlled controlled spain right. and even today where we may in the west or in, in america at least be enjoying a, a great degree of social prosperity well relatively <laughs> speaking a great degree of social prosperity more so than given in the past exponential curves uh, look at India, where you know Eve teasing is on the high. Where Eve teasing, women's rights are oh. you know absolutely they're they're abominable. Really, point being, it's uh, but the fact is that they, they have been put under <clears throat> not under fire, I would say, but they've been put in the spotlight recently, right? Yeah, they've been obviously- put in the spot, and 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 this this this. I mean, this ties into once again. Uh, I, I, I will visit this in a second because I'd like to hear other people talk about this. But uh, as they have been put into the spotlight, as the exponential growth for uh, the development of social rights and, and human rights has occurred, no matter where and no matter when in history, I believe firmly that that has spawned out of a nature of necessity, hmm. and so not out of sympathy. Not out of sympathy. Ooh, that's so, a tough line to cross. Right? I don't think that those uh, ideologies have to be uh, what's what's the word I'm looking incompatible. For? Incompatible, yeah. Um, I I think part of necessity is to love as as humans and as animals and as nature, and so some of that necessity to like you know dictate morality or what should be the rule of law or how society should function stems from from at the core love. You know, um, mm. and and so sometimes to protect your family or to fight for what you believe in or the people that you love, necessity falls in line with that that belief. Yeah, well, necessity, and as you know, your your local primalist, I'd say that's the necessity uh, necessity of propagation. <laughs> but uh, fair enough. No, I, I I I definitely I, I would agree with you that they're mm. they're hinged. At the same time, I, I believe the, the concept, the word itself, morality, is the spawn of necessity. That the, Although the two are necessarily hitched to each other, mm-hmm. it's not a biconditional. Necessity begets morality. So it's not a question of the chicken or it's, the It's egg not a question blood. of what do I love. The question is, why do I love what I love, and how does that love spawn from the fact that I need it? Well, what's your definition of what's a necessity? I mean, was it a necessity for the white majority in this country to um, go with um, African American civil rights? And I, I mean, that that wasn't a necessity for survival for the white majority at all. You that stole the words right generation. out of my mouth. Yeah. I, I actually, I think it does. <laughs> it is symbiotically linked with with the uh, survival of white America, if you can see my air quotes. Uh, the the policy in which we had started to take, or not had started to take, but the, the, which we had taken throughout history, from slavery to the Jim Crow laws, uh, was no longer sustainable. If uh, with, I mean, what what African Americans make up largely thirty five forty percent of the population in America right now? Then? Like then or now? No, no now. It's like oh, 15%. now? No, like less 15%. than that. Latinos, no, really? Latinos are the largest uh, minority group, then followed by African Americans, and they're about oh, it 12%. Is. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay, I was, I was definitely wrong on my statistics, and, and for that I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's why I'm here for it. <laughs> uh, point being, uh, for, from an issue of governance, uh, 
<laughs> I what 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 I see happening, and this is this is hard to address without treading, you know, the conspiracy line. I think there's a a great degree in which the policymakers of America realize that in order to adhere or to maintain social cohesion and to resist a collapse of society, that minorities needed to be included to a greater extent. But, I mean, that's still not going on but, today, though. See, I mean, that, you still, that stands, it's, it's not going on today. What was the root cause of that unsustainability, though? It was, it was people starting to realize, like, holy crap, these people are basically just like us, and we're treating them like shit. That's compassion. Yeah, I think that's, that's, really more of, I mean, that's more of where we're coming across. Like they were because, getting too strong and, like, and, taking... And what caused African-Americans to, like, no, I, fight against the rule of law at that time and... St- a lot of people put their lives on the line. And if yeah, not, their and lives, lives were the, taken. Their lives, lives were taken. Yeah. Going back to this whole idea of, I mean, so we have an argument for saying that civil rights, or not civil, well, civil rights included, but human rights in general, yeah. came out of a necessity. A, a, a necessity as the societies, as the the clans of in through which power has been disseminated throughout the centuries, as, as the human populace grows on this earth there is definitely a a, a metric of power that, that can be measured I'm saying as that metric can be disseminated throughout different peoples in different places the peoples of those places have had to accommodate such a uh, such power in, in order to perpetuate their their standard of living but then how do you explain something like the Universal Declaration, of, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that comes along and says these are binding factors to state power? People, states, yeah, states no, and come across and say, we'll mm, give up Yeah, power. When, when was we'll that passed? Up. That was passed in what? Like the, that was passed after World War II. I mean, yeah. that, was, that was a direct response to the Holocaust, many people will say. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to get at here is that is it not the case maybe that we're set up to say something like the Holocaust that happens is wrong from a sympathetic point of view, not necessarily from a necessity point of view. Yeah, but because while it while it, it was a it definitely was a tragedy, I don't think anybody's going to argue against that one. Yeah. I don't think somebody says we necessarily do not need any more Holocaust. I think the thinking was this is just bad, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, oh God, the Holocaust. That's that, 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 that's well, any that, any that, other that any other I, uh, call it genocide. Here. When here, is here, a genocide here, here, here's necessary? What I'll, here's what I will say in re- re- response to that, because God forbid that we get on. Well, we might just be getting on to genocide. On with it, Troilus. Uh, so what? That was passed in 1948. Could be. Let me check it. 46. Something like that. Ta- speak and I'll, uh, I'll Google. Point that. being, so 1948. Let's call that 1500 years minus. So it took uh, mankind 11.5 thousand years to come up with a standard of human rights. Eleven point five thousand, but man's been here since. No, I mean, I, I, man, if you go back to like no, I, I, Syria, I, 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 like man, I, the civilization has been here since like eight thousand BC. That's that's my that's my point. You know, I, they had rules of law. We may not like know what they wrote down, what they, their senses of morality. Well, were. they have a well, we, law. We do have, I, yeah, we do have, we do have that. Uh, yeah. Sanskrit, man. Point point being, I, I'm talking about you know pre Babylonian. Uh, or pre Hammurabi's code, I, I we are talking 1948, by the way. To uh, 19, it was 1948. Yeah, not a bad guess. Uh, that's it. Took over 11,000 years for us to come up with uh, with human rights. Yeah. So then why is so then why is but, why is Professor Talbot then incorrect about it being a, a general growth? I mean, if I, we can, I mean, I don't think he's necessarily incorrect about it. I, I think he's incorrect in the concept of it being exponential. I, I, no, 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 hold on. I, 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 yeah. I will say that. I will say this: the exponential bit does come from me. I do. I, I don't think he ever went up to a white boy. I think there have always been human rights. Oh no, no, for sure. But no, it, I, I, I was, I was just going to say something. To, it's to, largely for, hinged on on the the civilization to which it pertains. So right, but just to, just to clarify something yeah. about the about Professor Talbot's position. I don't think at any one point he went up to the board and drew an exponential graph. I was just trying to get yeah, a visual okay. aid out there. So, 
it's probably something along the different okay. lines. Okay, I'd say more like a plateau, if anything. <laughs> so you're just from economics, more Okay, see, that's that's, that's another thing I mean, that was... Martin Luther King said, uh, the more arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards just an arc is, you know, plateau mm-hmm. somewhat. So I, it's I, the opposite of the law of diminishing returns, right? It's uh, right. it's at the beginning part. I forgot. Man, look at us get it on economics too, man. <laughs> I, I, I was like, like, all I want to do is bring some econ in here. <laughs> I hope I really hope the microphone picked that up. We're talking uh, about like different like <laughs> different demand and supply curves in the back troll is just saying I like spirals. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but, no, I mean, no, no. For, to go on to the idea of the plateau, this is something yeah. else I was always in the class, but another idea that I wanted to bring up is this, is this idea that we're, whether we're finding different sorts of rights or whether we're finding different ethical outlets, let's say, let's call them that, uh, for how we express our ethics and how we deal with problem of ethics within our, our society and our culture, um, or anybody's really, is there is there a point where we say we draw the line on adding all these all these rights? Is there a line where we where, is there something where we say you know what oh, Sandra, we're done with all these art. all these human rights? We've got the ones that we need and they're beautiful. They work mm. for us. Mm-mm. No, no, absolutely not. That, because, can, that could never happen because there will always be a dominating group and a dominated. Group. Yes, and I mean that's like something we covered on the first podcast. You know. Right. From from these ideas of changing, and there will always be another issue that comes up later on in the line, and and the fact of these matter, these issues will always be issues because we're not all going to be homogenous in our ideology or belief in the end, even if we come to some sort of consensus in the books on the law, because at the end of the day, we're different people and we live by different moral codes. I but think the live... domination could be less severe, though, right? I mean, right. So I mean, after a while, the human. Did, yeah. Well. If... I think the, the the comedian Russell Peters nails this one on the head. Uh, oh, and, this is going to be so bad. No, no, it's not. It, you it, better do that in your best Indian accent. <laughs> no, it's, 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 no, no, we can't offend anybody. We can't. Uh, that, that, it's okay. That, that was actually okay. We're earning such a fine line. That, that was I'm our, our very brief so Indian I'll, I'll, guest, Raj. All right, all right. Russo, Russo has given us the the, the, the ability the, to be the, uh, the Indian I speak for or half of India. Okay, half of it. Half of it. Hey, wow, that's that's five billion listeners we just got. Hey, that's pretty good. Billion, billion. Uh, point being, Russell Peters, uh, I think he said, uh, as, as humorless, uh, with as much humor as possible, uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was literally the worst thing I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, I got something. Uh, no, I don't. Great. Well, point being, the, the crux of it was, it doesn't matter if you're white, it doesn't matter if you're black, someday we're going to get you and everybody's going to turn out beige. Uh, well, uh, yeah, technically. <laughs> Point being, even with when everyone is beige, even if, when if is that beige. even comes to he a probably day. meant brown though. He, he pro- pro- I don't know brown. when 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 you mix all the different you know colors from Russia to, to South Africa. Listen, yeah, if you if you if you go to the beige, Home Depot, you'll find that beige is a different sort of version of brown. Yeah, so. it's a uh, mm. it's it's slightly swarthy. Slightly sw- anyway. Uh, okay, so point being, but uh, avoiding avoiding the idea of a a uh, a full amalgamation of. Peoples. Well, no, no, I, I'm. Let's, but I'm saying, let's uh, assume that people stay where they are because people tend to stay within their own. Well, groups. it doesn't even matter if people stay where they are. If they don't, I, I'm, I'm saying theoretically, even if the world were to meld into one great and beautiful melting pot in which everybody was the same color, right? There would just still be societal differences in which, as Rousseau nailed it, there would be a, a, a dominant and a dominated. And, and 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 from that, huh. as 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 the powers shift, though, as that as the dominated become equals and or the the dominant in their own right, that 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 uh, that paradigm of power is going to shift. Yeah. So then and, and then from that power, as will the standards of, of morals and ethics. Let me ask this question: Considering what we've been talking about uh, earlier on here. If we say, okay, or if we have an idea that the way that we think about ethics, the way that we think about human rights, the way that we think about civil rights, at least in the history of this country, is sort of sounding like it's a defense mechanism for the, for the oppressed in the society to, to, either, uh, to either have it out or at least have something to hold on to, what happens if, theoretically, we do not, we do no longer live in a world where, uh, 
where there is an oppressed inequality. It, where there is, yeah, where everybody is completely equal in the sense Everyone's that completely just like a every, utopian, oh, like perfectly so, yeah, yeah, communist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about theor- we're talking about theoretic. So yeah, like Star uh, Trek could be Star Trek. Well, I'm, if you want to, I don't know. I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not a Trekkie myself. But um, so again, if there are no oppressed, do human rights or rights in general matter? I mean, I make a case that if if a group of people or even in a individual feels the need to completely dominate another group or individual, there's probably something wrong with them to begin with. I mean, I think it's not mm-hmm. human nature to want to dominate everything. So, I mean, i got to look at it from perspective of, I, th- I think it's natural to be compassionate and include everybody once you realize that everyone is, I don't know, I mean, this sounds kind of whatever, but we're all basically the same. So, I mean, I, I think that's what the the root cause of all um, the progression of human rights is. That's, that's what my intuition says, at least, but... Right, I mean, but I mean, the thing is that while while we may have an, that sort of intuition, it's historically speaking, it's not been the case, right? We've always had episodes of dominance, episodes of uh, obedience, of forced obedience. And how do they justify that dominance? You dehumanize it. They're not they, like us, right? So, so they're, they're not more, like us. I mean, so once you realize they are like us, because well, they're it's not as intelligent, or... right? Quite right, right, right. right. I, I, I mean. I, I enjoy indulging the, the the concept of a totally egalitarian society, uh, but I have to call BS on it. Hold on, but Trillis, I, I should I should have probably prefaced this. When we're talking about egalitarian here, we're talking about egalitarian forms of rights. People still can have different jobs oh. that lead to different. Just in the form of oh, rights, okay. that, that that everybody looks to be an equal human being. Then what human beings oh, become? So everyone oh, that's on the no, road. No, no, you're pandering to my libertarianism. Uh, yes, I am, <laughs> as, as I always <laughs> often do. I feel like that equality. <laughs> Could be attained, but only uh, through the dissemination of knowledge. Because it isn't without like the promulgation of knowledge, advancing yourself, learning history, learning how the the other is or, or thinks or feels, that you could get closer to being there. I mean, it, it's a very utopian idea. Right, but the question Absolutely. again is not necessarily how to get to the utopia. It's if we are in the utopia, uh-huh. okay, and we have a preconception of human rights... Before the fact, before the utopia showed up, okay, or at least before we showed up to the utopia, does it still make sense to hold on to a relic, the relic being human rights, at a time when we did have an oppressed and opp- and oppressed uh, an oppressing group? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. I mean, because we could always revert back and relapse back to. I um, mean, so you think? Which, do you think even in the utopian version, we still go back to a, a, human, a darker human, human nature? nature? You never know yeah. I mean, what some environmental influences could impact something, and we can. To, you know, fall back again. I mean, I would say the case that human rights took took a relapse from the Greek and Roman times to the medieval times. So, I mean, it, it can definitely happen. That's true. But or, 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 or just as the Almohad Caliphate uh, in the Iberian Peninsula has collapsed, well, I mean, at least in the Islamic world, into the totalitarianism of, of the mid 90s Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, well, I'm going to have to say that. Um, can you rephrase that question one more time? So, the, it was. Will we need uh, human rights? Do if human rights is, make sense if in, nobody's in going utopian. to be if nobody's mm. going to need them? Yes, they do. Still. And and the reason why and, and like my at first I was gonna say no, like if you had asked that question 20, 30 minutes ago, but I started to think at the end of the day, we all have the choice of free will. Like we have the freedom mm. to choose whether we wanna do what it is we wanna do. And so if we've got into a utopian society we had to choose to do that, but at the end of the day, there could be someone that would become powerful enough to crumble that well, out of greed or whatever. God bless your metaphysics. I, I, I disagree on the whole free will concept, but uh, <laughs> it's I, <laughs> I, 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 I definitely think it, it could come into, a, as, as Marcus said earlier, an issue of you know environmental uh, capacity in in a situation where it's a scarcity issue though uh, it could scarcity be it could be scarce land food. yeah exactly but it, i i definitely think that in this utopian society someone would be clever enough in realizing assuming nobody had done so yet which i don't <laughs> think is possible but let it go for now but just let it go for now it. With, with all my realistic intuition set aside if we were to indulge this actually happening <clears throat> which it wouldn't um, there would be someone who came along and said, hmm, there are these guys named Bentham and Mills, and if I hoarded all the happiness, I would totally be justified. I would. <laughs> and, and, 
don't know. In your point, world, in, point in B. my world, that doesn't make sense. No, point being, it does. What, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is that, uh, not, not to you know, pick on Bentham and Mills, you could, somebody could easily come along. They could say, I, an opportunist could come along and say, I could make my life better by manipulating you know, X amount of people. And then the question is, where does the ripple effect go from well, there? Well, the question is, does he have the power in, in that egalitarian society to well, do that? And secondly... You said he has people, free will and, 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 and equal rights, so yeah, why would he not have the, the power? the other people that he's trying to subjugate... Well, then it just are comes to a matter willing, of who's, who's are clever they willing enough. To, well, possibly, mm-hmm. but are they clever enough to stop his cleverness? Well, it's just like that. Uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's like that like, movie that came out with Ricky Gervais, The Invention of Lying. Imagine a society just came out. That's been like two years. Uh, okay, you know what? I don't have TV or internet. <laughs> so throw <laughs> I me feel a bone. You on that one, so. uh, uh, yeah, the Invention of Lying. Uh, you know, imagine a society wherein you cannot possibly lie. I think I think it's a great met- or philosophical premise myself. Who, the, the 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 person who comes with up with lying would be the most brilliant guy on earth. Until the time being, until yeah. someone yeah. until else until someone else out, realized that they they too could lie. And, 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 that, and that was that was that's my enlightenment and education. <laughs> lying is enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, well, that was, that, was, that was my point precisely. You're being deceived. You're Once, educating yourself. Oh, I, I'm going to keep everything yeah. as education. I'm yeah. Really, to say top of the persons would rise up and corrupt the youth whatever I mean to prevent that would be a, a good education system uh, I mean you uh, go back to the Mississippi well, even a rise up you have to be educated you gotta be that smart you know no you, I, I don't think you have you to be, I think you have to be curious enough to uh, be inspired to manipulate yeah. an X amount of people you you don't have to necessarily be educated you don't have to sit down and you know hit the books for 20 years and then all of a sudden Whoa, I'm brilliant uh, you just have Talk to say. Talk to me in twenty years. Yeah, Talk to me in twenty years, and then we'll <laughs> see what happens. Talk to me we'll in twenty brilliant. years. Yeah. Uh, what you have to do is you have to say, "How do I get that person to do something for me?" Back to, back to human rights, which has been the, the, the crux of this discussion so far. It's how you manipulate. It's how you manipulate. <laughs> human rights. I was really wishing that somebody was going to take. Take the or, or follow me well, into the into why the don't radical. You just promote well, a, your stance. Hey like, man, we're, we're that's what, yeah, that's like what, you don't have to. Well, we're being honest. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I'm not. I'm not. Dis- I'm not dis- I hope I don't sound disappointed. Uh, I, I sound disappointed because of other reasons. Yeah, I'm not. Dis- but, I'm not angry. I'm just. I'm just disappointed. I'm just disappointed with you. Um, <laughs> no, I. I Really, I, I just said, like you, I said, I you, didn't have... You wanted uh, to flex some brain nuts, didn't you, son? Huh? Yeah, so you wanted to flex some brain nuts. Well, I wanted to see if somebody else was going to follow me down the rabbit hole. I mean, I, no. all I was going to say was this, right? I if, don't think you're surrounded by that naive of people. You, after 30 minutes, I became enlightened, so I couldn't. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, maybe you will have a You almost had me. You will have a definition of that. You know, maybe, maybe there's something to be said about the fact that... Uh, if historically speaking, human rights do come from a self, from, or if you do take that viewpoint, because it's, I don't think it's forgiven. I'm not even I will go so far as to say yeah. human rights are definitely a defense mechanism. They they might be. Some people will. So I could see the argument for it. Is what I'm trying to say. I think you're wording it in the wrong way myself. Well, but, but agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. Let's. I mean, let's let's keep going with this uh, with this line of reasoning. In that, um, if you do live in a society, if you do live in a world where uh, where nobody's wronged, then rights don't make a difference. I mean, do, does, does that sort of follow? No, because in, in order to live in a world, and I, I like the way you put it this time, if you live in a world where no one is wronged, because there is no wrong, there are no bad things. Exactly. There are you no can't. bad things. So, and we don't need examples. But in a of bad world things. where no one is wrong, then you're pre-programmed to decide. Like that's the only world that I could see where that would exist. Or, or, well, or right. no, somebody well, has has informed you of what is like the the great gamut of all that which is wrong. That but no then one can you would do. have if someone has informed you, he's not your equal. He's above you. Exactly. You know. He can still be somebody who's above you, but you just he's just not somebody you're willing to wrong. Simply because either you don't know how to wrong or you're not willing to wrong. I, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's possible. If somebody's passing, God, passing Father, down <laughs> If somebody is some passing cases, down an order by by which you have no, 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 to order. follow people, this no, no, decree. People, or? It's not an order, it's not an order. People genuinely lack the capacity to wrong others. So everyone, people, either, no. either everyone knows love, equality, compassion. And they, they know everything else. You haven't met my ex. <laughs> like, 
Okay, well, apart from and, your and, ex. And, and it's not even about her. Like, I... I'm, point that I'm trying to make is not necessarily that we need to live or we need to strive for an absolute utopia where nobody can wrong people. I'm simply saying maybe there's something to be said about ethics being a personal check on the on the idea that we know we can do wrong. Uh, and I, 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 I like that this one transition. More time let me if, if, that, if I can repeat, last we, piece, yeah, last piece. we know we can do wrong. We know wrong is bad. I mean, that's sort of the definition of wrong. Because we want to necess- we we want to most likely be good people. Apart from obviously, you know, let's exclude the sort of maniacs out there that go around, you know, doing bad things okay. for the sake of doing bad things. But most of us, because we understand that wrong things are bad, we would like to avoid them. We then portray ethics, or we try to reach at the an ethical standpoint. Right. We try to define ethics, whatever you call it, um, simply to check our own human intuitions. Uh, I, I think it's bollocks. So uh, it's sort of like uh, a guiding light for what should be done. Not necessarily getting light. I mean, that that's part of it. But the other end, end of, is the other end oh, of it I, is that there's a check. It's. A, I, I think that's exactly what you're saying. Is, is it is a guiding light. The, but well, this, the, the, and we might have a guiding or a check, whatever you know, mince your so words, however you please. So the ethics would be a check on Point. itself, like against. No, no, no. Just on no. just on your own free will. On it action. Would be a check on your on action and your own yeah. free will. What you know. So, so let's say, you know, there's a puppy on the street or so, and you saw it, you'd say, am I going to kick this puppy, or am I going to let it cross the street? You'd yeah. probably not kick the puppy. If you right? are, again... If, 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 if you want to be a good ethical human being. And if being. you are a, a fully well-functioning sort of human being, obviously and, it, we have to deal with, I guess, people that are objectively, without a doubt, I suppose, that fully is, functioning ethical... To me, that check is beings. education, then. Education. It can be whatever. The check can be whatever. The check. check, Yeah. It's not. I'm not asking necessarily where the check comes from. I'm asking though, is it how? Is it what ethics actually is? So I'm. So I'm putting out Mm. this other definition of ethics. Is ethics a check on the fact that we ourselves think we're terrible things? I don't think so. Oh no, I'm sorry. Part of it. it. It's part of it. Part of it's to try to have harmony between. I mean. Your individual desires, I guess, and um, other motives of, of empathy and harmony within the community. I mean, there, there's some instances where it'd be obvious how to act. You're not going to kick the dog once there's something seriously wrong with you. But if you're confronted with two options, and I don't have a good example off the top of my the head. The dog's but, in um, your way. Right. If the dog is preventing you from getting something you really want, you know, um, mm-hmm. it depends how much you want that and how much that would help your life. You have to make that cost benefit analysis, I guess. That's when Which is a good way it, to it's it. easier to kind of have a, have an ethical, I guess, um, I don't know, framework so you can just make the choice easier, I guess. And you don't have to constantly think about what's, um, what I should do if, if you have, if you have a book, you know, yeah. go off. I don't know that. Just makes things easier in that sense. It does, and, and I think that, that cost benefit analysis really, I mean, I hate to sound repetitive, boils once again down to, to the concept of necessity. The idea is we're going too much into the specifics. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm i trying to still understand, I'm trying to still understand um, where we are in this. And I think it's probably a good place to, 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 call, it, to call it a day here. Yeah, um, but it's. Uh, it's a consideration I, I, I personally think is, is very compelling, is the idea that ethics, um, eth- that we, we go over ethics, um, we go over the idea of human rights simply because we know, I think either on a historical level or we know even from an a priori perspective that we are bad things, we, or we are we're capable of very bad things. I so think bad you're, you're, your inner Catholic is showing. My inner Catholic. <laughs> hey, what, you know, what can I say? It's... Um, but I mean, it, I don't think you need to be any sort of group or anything. I mean, you need to just be wary of the world around you. That you do know that there are bad things. No, I, I I think we are extraordinarily capable of doing wrong, and that wrong that we do, though it may, I mean, quite frankly, I I feel like I already shot myself in the foot by calling it wrong. We are capable of doing things that can be construed as unethical. Mm -hmm. Whether they are right or wrong is... uh, That's a value judgment. It's a huge value judgment. It's a a cost-benefit analysis. It's probably a private one as well. It's it's a private one as well. It's it's a really fickle area. I think all we can do is act in accordance to what we believe will yield the greatest cost benefit analysis uh, for yourself ourselves 
and and I, I hate to make it sound sound egotistical, but well, I mean it's self interest. It's it, 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 is, it, it is it is self interest, and and even the martyr Unless... who 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 dies for a cause is interested in in the perpetuation of his legacy. I would make a case though that a lot of self interest, I mean, boils down to others' interests as well. I mean, I, I think there's some part of the human psyche and mind that. Is I mean I don't want to go exactly. all metaphysical here, but I don't know if it's necessarily interconnected. But you, there's definitely I mean the greatest source of I mean joy a lot of times is compassion and connectedness. Well, I, mean, well, I think that's the good thing about life is that you can you can say I mean ethics is from an individual perspective, but it's really the individual perspective um, covers everybody as well in some states. Well, so, look at it from a stance of investment. Why do we, why do we you know I mean whether that be financial or emotional, why do we invest in things yeah. to get a return? Right. And and I, I I hate to make it sound so black and white, but when you you know give X amount of money to to a burgeoning company, a, you you expect or at least hope X amount of return. The same with relationships. You right. you invest X amount of, of, of time and interest, and, and you hope to God that you know something something comes back. Otherwise, you know you dump the fool. Well, you're looking at it from a personal perspective because not everyone partakes in that viewpoint. There's some mm-hmm. people that believe that the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people is in their best interest because yeah. by and, helping, and no and I'll, I totally agree friend, yeah. I, you know maybe I help myself oh, yeah. but furthermore that's just the way I am and, 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 and that there could be just people that th- that because their group I'm, I'm like, well group they ain't group they're, ideology they're, because their group ideology is so big they will forget the self at one point or another I mean it's a again it's it's a fine line and we're and we're really delving into I'm trying to understand people's psyches from outside Okay. Well, point point, point being, yeah. there, there there is a give and take that's involved with ethics, mm-hmm. and and that's that that's really all I want to want to say with it myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, my concluding observations is that we are out of time. <laughs> Literally, that is my concluding <laughs> observation. Is there is no that's such a God. thing. But that's for the metaphysics. Podcast. But that's for the metaphysics <laughs> podcast. You see, you see, I can't just put everything out in one podcast, <laughs> mostly because we don't have the disc space to do it, or uh, the discipline, or the discipline. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, thanks again, guys, for, uh, for listening to this, uh, fourth episode now, the Armchair Philosophy Podcast. Uh, we hope, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. So the next podcast is going to be on, this is Troilus's favorite subject, aesthetics. Aesthetics is what we're doing. Aesthetics. So we can talk about the beauty of anything. That will be, uh, that will be easily the most, uh, open-ended podcast we're ever going to have. For sure, because aesthetics is sort of that sort of thing. Well, no, only because I know you heavily disagree with much of what we've already talked about. In I heavily dislike so. a- aesthetics. Period. I know you I, heavily dislike aesthetics. I think, uh, I think if anybody's and checked I out the philosophy memes page, they know for a fact that aesthetics is normally the blunt end of many blunt jokes. <laughs> I have noticed. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed. I've noticed your podcast. I, 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 I haven't even... Makes sense. Well, it's fine. It's fine. Whatever. Anyway, anyway. Not for so, marketing purposes. So yeah. So the next one is is on aesthetics, and that's gonna be up uh, next Monday, as always. So uh, let's uh, clear this out. So for uh, Russo, for Troilus, and for Marco, this is Alessandro. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you. And it's uh, been a cheery time. Yeah. Have a have full a full of one. dolphins. Full of, no, it's not full of poverty. Dolphins. Anyway, have have a have a great day, you guys. We'll uh, see you next week.